Good evening and welcome to Rosemary Bible College. It's great to see you and to see some of you again and others who have joined us for the first time. Uh, this module is the fourth one and I'll be talking about that a little bit in a while. Uh, but it is called the big picture and in this module we, we look at some of the major doctrines in the Bible. And it's a very exciting journey because if you have been in the other modules or you have read through the Bible before, very difficult to see the big picture by reading book after book after book. And we've, have, we've had our journey through the whole of the Old Testament book by book. And then in the second, third module, the last module that we did, we did a journey through the New Testament, again, book by book. And although we stopped every time and talked about the message of each one of the books, it's not always easy to hold the big picture together, hence the title of uh, this particular module, The Big Picture. Looking at the Bible, taking a step back and saying, okay, so how does it all fit together? And that's essentially what we are doing. So welcome to all of you. And as is my custom, um, we're going to start with a devotion. Simply also to say to you that um, for those who don't know me yet, my name is Gerard Venter and I'm the Director of Studies for Rosebank Bible College. I also work at the church, Rosebank Union Church, where I'm the Pastor of Discipleship and Training. And uh, it's been my pleasure to offer this course and it's a passion of mine to help people to understand certain things that I personally don't understand. And so I'm taking people on a journey, it's a journey that we go along uh, trying to understand and dig deeper, and, and you'll see it, see it even tonight as we dig into some of the things about God. Uh, the title for tonight is God, and uh, there's so much about God that we do not understand, but there is, there's much that we do understand or that the Bible does make clear to us, and uh, those are the things we're going to delve into uh, every week, a uh, different uh, topic as we go along. Now, tonight being uh, as, uh, the, uh, having the topic of God or looking at God himself. I thought one of the things I want to do is look at Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And it says, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. God is all-knowing. God knows everything. God knows me. God knows my inner thoughts. There's nothing that I can hide from God, which is quite amazing. It's a characteristic of God. We're going to look at that um, in brief later on uh, tonight as well. Uh, the psalmist, as a result of that, says in verse 5, You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And I want to emphasize that as we go through the Bible and as we understand more about God, I, I guess we all will agree that the Bible is ultimately about God. It's not about me as such. As much as I want to understand salvation and I have a desire to get to know God and to be sure of my salvation, Ultimately, the Bible is about God and God's ways and how I fit into God and in God's plans of salvation, not how God fits into my plans. Uh, it is the other way around. And so, as we study God, as we study God's Word, we have to acknowledge that there is so much that we do not know. And as you will discover as we go along in this particular module, uh, if you think that people have differences of opinion about books in the Bible, they have even more differences of opinion when it comes to how to interpret certain truths in the Word of God. And so we have to acknowledge, uh, even when I state certain things and I hold certain views, I make no apology for the fact that I hold certain very strong views about certain things. But I'm also at a point in my life after many years where I acknowledge that uh, sometimes I have been wrong. I, I held my views, I changed my views because I, I came to a different understanding. But ultimately, when it, comes, when it comes to God and our understanding of God, we simply have to acknowledge we do not have all the knowledge about God. Uh, we, have, we, we will fall short, always fall short of our understanding of God. And that's what the psalmist here is saying. Then he says in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. 
If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The, the night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. In other words, God is everywhere. Not only does God know everything, God is actually everywhere. There's no place on earth or in the universe that we can go where God is not. Now, again, later on we'll look at the fact that God is the creator. Uh, and next week we'll unpack that a little bit more. Uh, that God created everything. And if we believe that God created everything, then God is bigger than creation. And everything that you and I see, my body, this space, uh, this country, continent, the earth, the universe, and how vast is this universe, God is bigger than that because God created all of that. So there's nowhere that we can go, not even in a spaceship or a satellite or anywhere, that we can go and God is not there. That's what the psalmist is essentially saying. He then goes on to say, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully, fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. And what the psalmist is saying is that there is nothing impossible for God. God can do everything and anything. There is nothing that God cannot do. God uh, is, and this is the big word for that, omnipotent. God is uh, omnipresent. He is everywhere. God is omniscience. God knows everything. And so we understand that God is much, much bigger. And we are creatures. I am a created being. It's God the creator and I'm a created being. Here I am a created being and I'm trying to understand the one who created me. But even as I look around, I see how big the earth is and I begin to understand how vast the universe is. And I begin to understand that if God is bigger than all of that, how, how in the world can tiny, tiny, tiny little me begin to understand who God is? And this is what the psalmist is trying to express over here, that God is everywhere, God knows everything, and God can do everything. And as we continue tonight, you will, you will see a little bit, just a glimpse of that. Uh, and what I'm doing really in this course is give you a very, very brief summary of what has been written about in volumes and volumes and volumes of books over uh, the thousands of years of Judaism and then Christianity following uh, uh, on that. Another thing that I want to highlight uh, tonight, just in terms of preparing as we go into this module, is that we will not have time to study the Word as such. I'm going to refer uh, in the notes, and you will have a copy of the notes uh, everywhere. There will be verses of Scripture or passages and so on. Just for the sake of time, we don't have time to go into that and study those passages in detail. I'm trying to fit it all together in, in themes and so when you do a thematic study of the Bible, you don't have time to go, in, in our short time here together, we don't have time to go into those different passages. So I, I want to encourage you to go home, read it up, and then continue to read what other people have written. And um, as I already said, volumes and volumes have been written on every single topic and subtopic uh, that we will be dealing with uh, in this particular module. Uh, we simply don't have time, and I don't have time to go into the history of theologians who have written about these things. I'm trying to extract from what they have written and what we believe about these different topics from the Word of God and then put it in such a way that uh, it, it is common shared knowledge among us. And even then, there are times when we may even here disagree with one another. I hope that there will be a, a core element of what we will agree on, uh, but there are also times when we will be disagreeing with one another, and that's fine as, as long as we agree to disagree with one another on certain topics. I'll share more with you uh, as time goes on, but let's pray together as we start uh, this module together. Our Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come together. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the facilities that we have to do this. 
and thank you that you have given us your word, the Bible, the written word, uh, it, which we can read, uh, where we can begin to understand more about you and who you are and how you have chosen to reveal yourself to us. And Lord, I pray that as we journey together, this, this will be an exciting time as we learn, as we expand in our knowledge. But above all, Lord, we pray that you would use the knowledge uh, to bring us closer to yourself in a deep relationship with yourself. And I pray that this will be a time of blessing for us, a time of spiritual growth, a time of growth in our knowledge and understanding. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Even before we start, there's something that I want to make cl uh, clear as I explain to you what I believe to be uh, some core issues of the faith. Uh, issues that we, uh, especially as evangelicals, will agree on. Uh, most of us will agree on that. Uh, a, a topic such as, what is the Bible? This is the Word of God. Now, if anybody says, no, parts of this is not the Word of God, then we, we're, we're in a major disagreement. So, the first thing we need to acknowledge is that what God has revealed about Himself is written in this book called the Bible. We'll talk more about that next time in our second lecture. Um, that Jesus is God and that Jesus is the Messiah. That Jesus died on the cross, that He rose from the dead, that He ascended to heaven, that Jesus is coming back. Those are core issues of our faith. And we need to almost agree to agree on those because they actually form the core of our belief of what we, what we share together. But then there is another circle and I would call those uh, peripheral doctrines or issues where we will disagree with one another on certain issues. The very fact that we have different Christian denominations uh, proves the fact that on certain issues we, we disagree and we agree to disagree. We're not fighting one another, or hopefully we're not fighting one another. There's enough out there in terms of the world and the devil and evil that we need to fight, that we really don't have to fight one another. Um, but I hope that within this course that I will be staying as much as possible within the inner circle. In other words, the core beliefs. Uh, that doesn't matter which denomination you represent here, uh, that we will agree on those issues. Uh, and then there will be issues that I will raise from time to time, and I'll be very clear with you to say uh, different Christians or, or different uh, scholars or different denominations hold different views, and I will even try and explain to you some of those views. Now, I may personally come down hard on one particular view. I can't hold three views. I have to hold a view, and I will have a view. But I, I'm, I'm sure that most of those will be on the peripheral issues, such as we believe in the second coming. That's core to our belief. But when it comes to the circumstances, the timing, the, uh, the issues around the second coming and how and when Jesus will come back, different Christians hold different views on that. I have a particular view. I'm very happy to share my view with you, but you are also very um, welcome to disagree with me and say, no, no, I, I hold a different view. Uh, that will be fine. Now, when it comes to Rosemary Bible College, in terms of the modules, um, this is the fourth of the foundational modules. Uh, some of you, many of you, have been in the first three modules already. The first one is simply asking the question, uh, what is this book by the Bible? Why do we believe in it? What do we find in it? Uh, what's the background to it? The history of uh, the Bible and the history of Israel and the church and so on. So those are things we, we looked at in the first module. Some Bible study methods and so on we, we talked about. And then the second and the third modules really took us through a survey of both the Old and the New Testament. And uh, for those of you who have attended that, that's been a journey as we journey through the Bible. Each of the modules is self-standing, um, uh, standing on its own, so you don't have to feel bad that you haven't been in those uh, because you, you won't necessarily miss anything, and there's always another opportunity uh, to catch up on that work. In this module, the fourth one in the big picture, we learn more about the different aspects of our faith. What do we believe, and how do we express what we believe? And um, I'm going to try and put that in sort of uh, some systematic uh, format so that we can go through it uh, in, in good time. 
We also learn about the church over the last 2,000 years. Uh, we certainly not new around. We don't have to forge our way into brand new territory. Um, I always say to students, uh, if anybody by now comes up with something brand new, he's probably wrong. Uh, because there cannot be, after 2,000 years, anything new that you discover about the Bible. There's nothing new in the Bible. This, this book is 2,000 years old. The way we look at it, the way we interpret the Bible may have different angles. Uh, there may be a different challenge, a different false doctrine that needs to be addressed, etc., etc. And those will be new nuances or different angles. We come to, this, uh, to the same truth. But at the end of the day, there's nothing new. And the church has grappled with these issues that we are talking about in this module for 2,000 years. And uh, that's why I'm talking about the volumes and volumes and volumes of works that have been written and published over years uh, where people have literally grappled and written down the things that they believe uh, and, and how they have even debated the issues with one another. When it comes to the fourth module, uh, in terms of our themes, tonight we're going to look at God who He is and why we believe in God, um, after a bit of an introduction. And then next week we'll look at the concept of revelation. It's not the book of revelation, but the concept that God revealed Himself. And then we'll also look at creation, the fact that God created everything. The week after that, in the third module, we'll look at mankind, uh, sin, salvation, and the fact that God created human beings They've fallen into sin and how God operates in terms of saving people from sin and all the doctrines related to that. And then for two weeks in a row, we'll look at the person and the work of Jesus for one week. And then the next week, we'll look at the person and the work of the Holy Spirit to understand that. We then will be looking in, in lecture number six at the church. What is the church? Why do we believe in the church? And what, what, do, what does the church look like in this world? And then also answering some of the questions such as why do we have different churches or different denominations within the Christian tradition? I feel strongly about the fact that Jesus sent us into the world to proclaim the gospel. So a whole lecture I will spend simply on the task of the church in this world is mission, to be on mission. It's God's mission. Um, some people refer to that as missions. We'll look at the definitions around that when we come to lecture number seven. And then in the last lecture of this module, we will be looking at the second coming, uh, how it all will culminate in the second coming. So that will take us on a journey uh, through, if you wish, salvation history, from where God, we believe that God existed forever, uh, in eternity, He created it all, and how He journeyed with us through all of these different topics that we'll be talking about, and then how it will finally culminate in the second coming of Jesus Christ. So that, that is really a, a full, complete journey, if you wish, with lots and lots of things in the middle uh, and many, many things that we cannot even begin to touch on, not in the short time uh, that we have together. When it comes to prescribed works, um, there are two books that I would like for you to get uh, and to read. Much of what I'm doing in this course has been based on um, a little publication that we put together with the help of my friend Kevin Roy. Uh, we were colleagues in Cape Town years ago, and he is currently the pastor of the Mulders Drift Union Church uh, in Mulders Drift on the West Rand. And uh, he has put together uh, notes for this course for me, and so that is available. Uh, you can buy that. I think it's 10 or 20 rand a copy for that. And then there's a book by Grudem. Wayne Grudem is a well-known systematic theologian, and he's written a systematic uh, uh, vol volumes of systematic uh, work, um, several volumes. That has been abridged in one thick volume, and then that has been uh, simplified in a very thin little booklet, uh, which is called Christian Beliefs, and that's the one that I prescribed, the little one. Uh, that's available from our bookshop or at any good bookshop you would be able to find uh, Wayne Groom's book. If you're interested in reading more, then um, Bruce Milne is a book that I can highly recommend. I will bring a copy and show you at some point in time. It's called Know the Truth. Uh, and then also um, the New Bible Dictionary, the book that I have, or the dictionary that I have recommended uh, for all of the modules. Uh, every one of the topics that we deal with, you will find articles written on that and plenty of other articles related to beliefs about the Bible, beliefs about the doctrines that uh, we talk about in this course 
Uh, and then I, I cannot even begin to mention the different books available in the bookshops when it comes to doctrine. Some are abridged versions, uh, one volume versions, others literally the, the topic of God will be a volume, the topic of Jesus will be three volumes, and so the list goes on. Uh, some people have written volumes and volumes and volumes just on the topics that we uh, discuss here tonight. Uh, when it comes to the internet, I have cautioned you in the past it uh, doesn't matter what topic you will, you will type in. If you t simply type in and you Google God, you will come up with millions and millions and millions of websites. Um, and, and, and it will be everywhere and anywhere. So when it comes to the Internet, this is probably the most dangerous uh, kind of module to go and search, simply search the Internet in terms of uh, help me to understand God. Uh, you will have millions of views on God and from all different faiths and religions and backgrounds and so on. So if you do do that, make double sure you know the source of what you are doing or what you are studying uh, on the Internet. I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. Uh, by all means, please search as much as you possibly can. Just make double sure that you know the source and where it's coming from uh, before you start believing everything that is posted uh, on the Internet. These things we believe. Now, from the earliest times, the church had a need to define what it believes. Um, it, it resulted in many statements of faith, where the church over 2,000 years um, put together, sometimes as a group of people, sometimes one person would, would be the, the thinker on behalf of a church or a church tradition. And the early, early church, uh, when it was still one unified church, they came together, even in Acts chapter 15, we read how uh, Paul and Barnabas and several other missionaries went back to Jerusalem. They met with the leadership in Jerusalem because there was an issue that they needed to discuss, the issue of circumcision. Do we need to circumcise the Gentiles before they become, be, be, can become Christian? The church uh, debated that, prayed about that, and then eventually came up with a statement. And that's really a statement of belief or a statement of faith, if you wish, on a particular topic. But now as time went on uh, in church history, the church uh, more and more saw the need to actually make a statement and make it more, uh, uh, more, more complete, in, comprehensive, in order to say, what do we believe about God? Because as you will see in, um, in every lecture, I'm going to talk about certain false teachings or beliefs about any one of the topics that, or all of the topics that we are dealing with, you will see that there are a, a, a multitude of different beliefs uh, around every single topic. Many of those are false beliefs or going in the wrong direction. And the early church had to deal with that. Even in the New Testament we find that. Uh, and that is why they needed to get together or come together and make a statement of faith. And this is precisely what has happened again and again and again in church history. And every time there's a new challenge or there's a massive issue that is arising and the church comes together or leadership come, uh, people in, in leadership come together and they debate they, and then they put out a statement to say this is what we believe. We, this is what we believe about the Bible or this is what we believe about God or salvation and so on. Now, why do we state what we believe? Uh, I think, firstly, because we know, we need to know for sure what we believe. Um, now, again, I guess you would say, or some people would say, you have it all in the Bible. I mean, you know, you can just read the Bible, it's all there. But the very fact that people disagree on how to interpret the Bible or certain issues in the Bible is proof of the fact that we don't always understand clearly and immediately and directly what is meant by a particular statement in the Bible or about a certain topic uh, in the Bible. And that is why we have different denominations, because they disagree on certain issues. It's not necessarily all wrong, um, because it also gives expression to the, uh, I would say, the variety of different ways in which people understand God. As long as it's within the core beliefs, as I said, and even on the periphery, it's when you start moving outside of the peripheral issues, uh, you start dabbling with, with uh, untruth or false doctrines that we're in danger. Um, so to know for sure what I believe brings assurance. But it also gives an account to others about what we believe. And in a moment, I'm going to just read First Peter 3 uh, with you. 
Uh, and Peter says we need to be ready to explain to others, I'm using my own words, to explain to others what we believe. If we are challenged, we need to be able to say to a person, this is what I believe. Um, just by way of one quick example, we'll talk a little bit more about creation next week. Now, uh, the, the creation or the way creation is described in the Bible has been challenged from many different angles. And our children, uh, if you have children, are now growing up in a system where it is simply believed that the evolution theory as it stands is true and that the Bible cannot be true. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that next week. Now, if, if I'm in a situation where a person assumes that the Bible account is simply wrong and that pure evolution as it's taught in schools and universities today is right, then I need to be able to answer that and have some way of answering that which is why we will be looking at that briefly uh, next week. But also to counter the arguments of those who do not believe what we believe. And, and you are rubbing shoulders, we all rub shoulders daily with people who do not believe in God, for example. Uh, atheists don't believe that there is a God. And we rub shoulders with those kind of people daily. Or that we cannot know God. Or um, that the Bible is not necessarily true. Or this is not a true account of, of, um, of what... Uh, truth really is all about. Uh, and so the list goes on. So we need to understand what we believe so that we can answer people who do not believe the way we do. And then to oppose false beliefs. In fact, this is the way that the first statements of faith actually came about, is because of false teachings. People going off on a tangent, uh, beginning to teach certain things about God and salvation that went way wrong and they needed to be pulled back, or the church need, needed to come together to say, this is what we believe, and that teaching is wrong, because this is the right teaching. And so that's another reason why we need that. And then also to instruct others uh, in the knowledge of God, uh, whether you are a Sunday school teacher, uh, or you have a leadership position in a church, or you have children in your home. Uh, I think it's good to know what we believe. And, and of course, I'm not going to sit my children down when they're five years old and give them a whole theological speech. Uh, that's not gonna, going to happen, but it helps to have a broader frame of reference uh, in order to help our children and young people and whatever uh, other situations we may be in to help them understand what we believe. Here is the quote from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5, 15 and 16. But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And when Peter here talks about the hope, he's talking about our hope in God. Not as in, I hope there is a God, uh, but rather, I know that there is a God and I, I know that my hope is certain. And therefore, I know that there's a God and I know that God will save me. And so, that's the hope. So, in general terms, one can say, Peter here is talking about our faith, what we believe, and that's the hope that we have. But, and this is what I want to point out to you, and this is the attitude that I'm appealing to you, and that I'm hoping that I would be displaying to you, but also appealing to you to display to others. But do this with gentleness and respect. There is no need for us to go and take up weapons and shoot everybody because they don't believe what we believe. Uh, there is no need for us to get aggressive and to lose our tempers when we talk to other people, and when we even talk to one another about those peripheral issues where we may disagree on certain things. And there are people out there, and you are rubbing shoulders with them, who don't believe the core issues that you and I believe. And if we do uh, bounce in, uh, bump into those people, we need to share with them our belief, but do it gently and with respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And there is no doubt that other people and other beliefs and people who don't believe in God or people who are not Christians will slander you and your faith and look for opportunities to nail you if they can. And we need to respond with gentleness uh, to that and with respect, says Peter. When it comes to statements of faith, I've said... Uh, much about this already, but throughout history the church has produced many such statements of faith to help guide the church and Christians in what we believe uh, about the truth in God's Word. Most denominations 
and then also individual churches uh, adapt those statements. There are some denominations, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the course, but there are some denominations that accept certain historical statements of faith as part of their belief system. And if you become a member of such a church, then you need to almost sign on the dotted line that you agree with that particular statement of faith. Now, um, most churches will either adopt or adapt those statements of faith. As I said to you, there's not going to be anything new in this world, uh, certainly not in terms of the way the Bible has been written. That's final. The, the book is final. We're not going to add to the, to the Bible anything more. But the way we interpret that and also the kind of challenges that we face will mean that we will sometimes adapt our statement of, uh, statements of faith in order to make more clear what we believe about certain things. Now, those statements of faith, depending on your own tradition, uh, will be adaptable. In some traditions, some church denominations, they believe that those historical statements will not be fiddled with. They are in concrete, and we will uh, not put them equal to the Bible necessarily, but, but we will adopt them and then make sure that in the future we, we teach others to do the same. Uh, there are other traditions who say, we, we don't want to fix it. We don't want to put it in concrete. Uh, we want to leave it open-ended. The Bible we won't touch, but the statements of faith, we can tune them, uh, adapt them, uh, simply as we go along to make sure, and you don't do that every year, but you may have to do that every 50 years or every 100 years or so, and come up with a, a, an adapted version of a statement of faith. That depends, again, on your denomination and your tradition or the tradition that you represent. In some circles, uh, mostly the more liturgical and traditional churches, uh, such as Roman Catholic and Anglican traditions and so on, uh, the statements of faith are referred to as creeds. Uh, and when you go to the internet, for example, there is a website, www.creeds.net. You'll be able to read many of these statements of faith. I encourage you to do that, actually. It's a very good website. It's simply factual, uh, and it, it uh, publishes many of the creeds that have been, or the statements of faith that have been uh, uh, put out over the years. Now, let me just talk a little bit about some of the most commonly known um, creeds or statements of faith. The Apostles' Creed, for example, is something that many of us know very well. It was developed between the 2nd and the 9th century. In other words, we're talking about hundreds of years working on this particular statement to make sure that it reflects the essence of what we believe. And when you look at it, and I'm going to put it on the screen in a moment, but when you look at it, it is actually only really the essence. There is so much left out, uh, the, the developments that happened over the years, uh, that the Apostles' Creed does not address. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why Many believe that we need to be able to adapt some of these creeds or statements as we go along um, because there are different challenges that we face. And then there is the Nicene Creed. This goes back all the way to the 4th century when Constantine, Emperor Constantine, uh, adopted Christianity. Uh, some people say, say he became a Christian. Others say he didn't become a Christian, but he became very favorably disposed towards Christianity. Whichever way you interpret that, the fact of the matter is that Constantine represents a massive shift in church history. Because up to that point in time, the Roman Empire persecuted Christians almost everywhere from time to time, um, more so than other times. But when, when Constantine uh, adopted Christianity, he made Christianity almost a state religion, uh, and that's another whole story on its own. Um, but during his time, uh, the, the church leadership from around the Western world especially, uh, and some Eastern Christians came together uh, in Nicaea, and uh, the Nicene Creed was uh, written at that particular time. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along, especially when we talk about the person and the work of Jesus Christ uh, during that one lecture. The Apostles' Creed reads like this. It says, I believe in God, and this may sound very familiar to many of you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And so, in this very short, brief creed, you have a reference to the Trinity, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And then you also have, and it's one of the topics uh, in our course, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. This has got nothing to do with the Roman Catholic Church. The word Catholic means general or generic church. And so and in those early stages, um, they simply said, we believe in the church. We believe the church is God's way of working uh, in this world. And then um, the, the fact that, that the saints, and saints here meaning Christians, need to come together in communion, that sins can be forgiven, that we will be resurrected, and that Jesus is coming back, and that there will be everlasting life. So, uh, in, a, in a short little statement, it's actually quite a mouthful. Now, every one of those lines can be expanded upon and can be interpreted, and books, plenty of books have been written just on the Apostles' Creed, and uh, we, had, we don't even have um, you know, nearly the time to go into those kind of details. Where do we learn about our faith? Where do we learn the things that we believe? And, and why do we have a course like this one? Well, the most important source for learning about God and our faith is the Bible itself. I mean, there is no doubt that as you read through the Bible, and um, people have, have done for us what would have been a very difficult task, and that is to go through the Bible and say, what, what does the Bible teach about God, the topic for tonight? Or... Go through the Bible. What do we learn in the Bible about Jesus? Starting in the Old Testament in Genesis, ending with Revelation, what do we know about Jesus? At the end of the day, this is the most important source for our knowledge about the truths that we're going to talk about in this course. So I can only encourage you to read and study the Bible regularly. The more you do, the more your faith will be confirmed. You will be built up in your faith. And the more many of the things we talk about here will begin to fall into place. In doing so, you will need a concord concordance. Uh, a concordance, uh, we talked about that in module number one, but a concordance is where you have words uh, used in the Bible, and then uh, let's say you want to look up the word faith or the word God, and it will give you all the references. Nowadays, concordances are available on, on, uh, on either on the Internet or in software, software packages, and it makes it a lot easier to, to look up a word. You can just type in a word and you have all of the references given to you uh, in detail. And then study Bibles uh, and obviously commentaries. Uh, again, we talked about those things uh, in the past, but those things help you to understand the Bible. And then there are books on theology, and I've already said a little bit about, spoke a little bit about that. And uh, they are a great help because they are normally written in topical fashion. In other words, chapter by chapter, and this is the way Grudem's book has been written and the little book by Kevin Roy, the notes by Kevin Roy, and, and just about every other book um, on systematic theology. And that's the reason why it's called systematic theology. It is taking theology and doing a systematic study of the scriptures on a particular topic the topic of God, the topic of Jesus, the topic of the church, or salvation, whatever the topic may be. And those books are tremendous helps uh, to steer us in a particular direction. Sermons, good sermons, if they are biblically based, will give you a lot of your theology. Hymns that have been written, songs that we sing nowadays, and it's amazing how they inform our theology. And, and sometimes subconsciously, as we sing them, and as we listen again and again to sermons by particular preachers, our own views of God and the Bible are formed by what we hear. They are informed by what we hear, and our views are formed around the input that we receive, either through song or through preaching or whatever. And then other Christians, primarily scholars, people who make theology their life, as it were, they sometimes called or mostly called theologians. I guess to some extent all of us are theologians because we hold certain views on theology. 
um, but there are professional theologians, people who have studied uh, and they work in this environment or they teach it, uh, and, and they are great helps to help us understand. And those are the kind of, the kind of people we pick up the phone or we email them and say, uh, what do we believe about this or what do we believe about that? I answer questions like that on a fairly regular basis. Just the other day, someone uh, asked me just this last week about communion, for example, and what do we be believe about communion and our church and how we approach communion. Now, in answering the question, there's some practicalities around communion or the Lord's Supper, but there are also theological issues around that. And, and so obviously my answer included some of those um, responses that I, I, I hope would have guided this particular person in understanding more about that particular topic. Just a few cautionary notes when it comes to the Bible, some guidelines that we need to follow. We have been through a little bit of that in the first module, but we need to take care not to try and prove text. You can virtually prove anything from the Bible. You, hold, you take a view, you can go and find a verse to prove it. Now, that's the wrong approach. We should go to the Bible and say, what does the Bible teach on a topic? And let the Bible inform our understanding so that we then can come to a view and not the other way around. We call it proof text uh, method. Uh, I already have made up my mind what I believe about heaven or hell or eternity or salvation or God or whatever. Now I go to the Bible and try and prove it from there. Uh, and that is obviously the wrong way to do it. We need to base our beliefs about God on the entire Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments. Um, it is important that we see the Bible as one single book with one single message. And we cannot just delve into one part, either or. Um, and, and I'll be pointing out some of the false beliefs that arise as a result of the fact that some people, for example, go back to the Old Testament and they start rejecting or neglecting or even rejecting the New Testament. And if that happens, uh, you have a very, very narrow view of what God is trying to do in this world. And then we need to follow proper principles of interpretation. We call it hermeneutics or proper hermeneutical rules uh, in drawing conclusions from a passage of Scripture. And we always should be looking at a very rich church tradition. Um, I'll say it again. We have 2,000 years of history. People have been uh, walking this road to the point where it's a, uh, a, a well-traveled road, uh, the, the road we call theology. And so it's not as if we, for the first time, need to come up with some new thought. Um, we will read the scriptures. We will come to a conclusion or an understanding. We can then go back and check it with what other people have already written. And, and then there are the peripheral issues where people disagree on certain issues. Again, that road has been well-traveled over the 2,000 years. And you will find in history people who, who agree with you on particular views and others who will disagree with you. It's always good to read the different uh, opinions and views. The word theology, I don't believe you have this particular slide. Uh, it's a picture slide. Theology uh, is the study of the nature of God and religious truth. Rational inquiry into religious questions, especially those truths posed by an organized religious community. Another meaning is an organized, often formalized body of opinions concerning God and man's relationship to God. And then it can also refer to a course of specialized religious study. Some of the basic beliefs of our Christian faith is what we are going to tackle in this module. And I I trust that they are based, uh, solidly based on the Word of God as we continue forward. The first topic, as I promised you, and I've been, all of this has been introduction, and so now we really get our teeth into that first doctrine, which is we believe in God. What do we mean when we say we believe in God? Uh, who is this God that we believe in? And how do we get to know God? And what I'm going to try and do uh, in, in this section uh, until the end uh, tonight is to, to have certain pictures of God, characteristics of God, uh, why we believe in God, and then some false doctrines about God uh, and, and have a look at that. And hopefully at the end of this, we will have a, a better understanding of who God is. Now, theology, the word theology is actually a study of God. And uh, some people refer to this as theology proper. Because the word theos 
and Logos uh, in Greek. Theos is God and Logos is word or it has taken on the meaning of study. And as you will see every week, I'm going to give you the big theological terms. Uh, tonight is not very difficult because theology is, I think, a fairly well-known word. But as we continue, I'll give you the, the theological terms, but I'll also explain to you what they mean uh, every time. And you'll see that the word ology at the end of almost every one of the different topics will occur, as you will find uh, with archaeology, uh, psychology, and so on and so on at universities, and it really just means a study of whatever it is. In this particular case, a study of God. We acknowledge, as I said to you when we looked at Psalm 139, that there is no way, not even a chance, that we can begin to understand God fully. If we can, my argument would be, then God is no longer God, because then I have submitted, or subjected rather, I have subjected God to me. The moment I can take a frog and put it on a table, cut it open, dissect it and explain everything about the frog and how he thinks and how he jumps and all those kind of things. Uh, I am the frog's master and I have been able to explain to you everything about the frog. We need to understand that, I, that we cannot dissect God. We cannot put him on a table here. We can't even, I can't even show him to you tonight because God is spirit as we will see. And, and so there's no way we can study God as we study any other topic, whether it's science or uh, archaeology or whatever other ology there they may be. Uh, when it comes to theology, we immediately acknowledge our limitations in this regard. God is spirit. Jesus says that in chapter 4 of John when he speaks to the Samaritan woman. And um, she has a bit of an argument to say, um, you Jews say that we must worship in Jerusalem, but we Samaritans, we worship on Mount Gerizim. And Jesus said to her, uh, God is spirit, and there's going to be a time when, when God will only be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And so it's not about a place, is really what Jesus was saying to her. It's not as if you can take God, even Solomon acknowledged that. When he built the temple, he said, God, even this grandiose building that I put together with all the gold cannot contain you because you're so much bigger. But the temple represented the presence of God uh, for the Jews at that time. And so what Jesus was saying to this woman is, it's not about a place, it's not about a temple, it's not about a mountain, whether it's Mount Zion or Mount um, Moriah or Mount Gerizim, not about Jerusalem or Gerizim. It's about God. God is much more. And God is everywhere. He's everywhere present, as we saw in Psalm 139. And, and therefore, God can be worshipped any place at any time. We can only know God to the, to the extent that God has made himself known. That is a truth we need to get into our minds. We can't go out there in the universe and start searching for him. Uh, some dude who went up on a, a, one of the spaceships came back and he said, I, I, I looked around and I never saw God. Uh, you, you, you can't see God, not even flying up in the sky uh, to the moon or even beyond the moon. There is no way we will be able to discover God, go and search for Him like we do science. And suddenly there's a formula and I, I discovered it. There's nothing like that with God. We can only know God to the extent that He reveals and revealed in the past tense Himself uh, to us. Our sources for knowing God, I've already elaborated and so I'm not going to do that anymore. But the Bible is our primary source of knowing God. But it is also true that God has revealed himself through creation. Now, a bit more about that next week when we look at, at what creation and science uh, can contribute to our understanding uh, of God. But history, uh, primarily as God revealed himself since the coming of Abraham or the calling of Abraham and then the coming of Jesus about 2,000 after Abraham. And at the end of the New Testament era, or the putting together of the New Testament documents, that's where God has been journeying with the Jews, and then with the church, and now the canon is complete, as far as we are concerned. And so we know God from history, the way He worked in the Bible, as we read about God in the Bible. But it is also true that God has been working in the whole of the universe, and in the whole of history as well. 
So little bits and pieces of information can come our way when we look at history. And then it's also true that you and I, each one of us, represents the image of God. We've been created in the image of God. And if that is true, we'll talk more about the image of God next week. But if that is true, then something inside of me is a reflection of God. Even the grossest sinner out there is still created in the image of God. A broken image now because of sin, but still created in the image of God. Which is why there's a desire in every single one of us and in people groups around the world to know God, to come to know God. They, they search for God. It is the minority of people who are atheists who say, no, there is no God, and I'm not even going to search for Him. They, they are actually, as far as I'm concerned, in denial. Um, most people, um, the vast majority of people, have a desire to know God. And so somewhere inside of us, there's, there's something of God that we can discover. Not, not, not inside of me, but there's a desire inside of me to discover God. Now, you, when you put it all together, my desire, my conscience, the way God worked in history, the way God works in creation around us, and Romans 1, Paul tells us, if it stops there, even those people know something about God enough to be judged by God. But then, and for us, this is the wonderful, the, the, the marvelous fact is that ultimately it comes back to the Bible. And this brings it all together, ties it all together for us, where we now know God personally and intimately because God chose to reveal himself in the scriptures. Now, before we look at who is God, we're going to take a break and then afterwards we'll come back and uh, finish the lecture. All right, we're going to look at who is God. God is the creator, and we'll talk more about God as creator next week. But God made everything out of nothing, and that's a concept that blows my mind. I think for people like us, we are creative, uh, but we need something. I need clay or a plan and building materials, and I can create stuff. But the concept that God created everything out of nothing is something that is beyond me. I don't understand that, but this is very clear from Genesis 1 and 2 and also Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 3, God is the ruler over the universe. Um, God rules everything. He is king. Uh, it's, it's a concept that we see regularly. When you turn to the book of Revelation, you find God sitting on a throne, which I think is a, a symbolic picture to help us understand that God is the ruler of the universe. And there is um, nothing that, that is outside of God's view and that he doesn't control. Again, it's, it's a mystery for us uh, when it comes to evil. Uh, and, and now the arguments will start flying. And that is, did God create the devil? Well, number one, he did. Um, we'll talk more about that. Um, did he create him as the devil? No, he didn't. Now, those are things that, that we need to try and understand. Now, is the, di the devil subject to God? To God? Yes, he is. Um, why doesn't God control him better uh, or prevent him from, from uh, disturbing us. And, and the questions go on and on and on. And at the end of the day, we simply have to come back and say to ourselves, God is ultimately in control. And that, by the way, is essentially the message of the Bible, is that God is in control. That's the picture that we get, the big picture that we get when we go to the book of Revelation. And those of you who attended module number three will know that that is essentially the message of Revelation 3. God is in control. God is also the supreme being. He is the sovereign God over everything. Daniel chapter 5 uh, confirms that, as does the whole of Scripture everywhere. God is also the Savior. Uh, a typical mistake that New Testament Christians make is to believe that Jesus is the one who saved us, but God is the one who punishes us. And that is a wrong conce concept altogether. God is the one who saves. And even the New Testament, by the time you get to Timothy and Titus, Paul talks about God our Savior. Um, and it's, of course it's true that Jesus came into this world representing God to come and save us, to die for our sins. Jesus is therefore our Savior. But Jesus is also God. Now I'm again moving into mysterious uh, area. 
uh, mystery type stuff that we don't know how to explain properly, and we'll talk about that. But God should be punishing us, but He doesn't, not the way we should have. Uh, he reaches out to the world and to sinners in order to save them. And then God is a judge. The, God is the final authority. And uh, we need to understand that in the light of God as the supreme being and God as the ruler over the universe, and God will rule by judging over the world. Interesting that the book Judges in the Old Testament has the title Judges, but it really means leaders. And in that sense, God is king. He is judge. Now, he is the judge in the sense that he is ruling over everything, but is also the judge in the sense that he is the one who will ultimately punish people for their sins if they, if they aren't saved or they don't come to know Jesus Christ. Some of the misconceptions about God, uh, and I want to throw this in at the moment. I don't believe these are false doctrines yet. Uh, it's simply the fact that some people don't understand who God is. When, when people believe that God is one among many, um, then I believe they are wrong and they, they have a misconception about God. God is unique. He is the only one. He is God and the only God and uh, the only true God. And there may be other gods, and the Bible even referred to these other gods, but when, you, when we turn to the New Testament, Paul eventually says those gods are actually not, not even existence. They, they, they're false gods, and they are not even gods at all. Uh, and the one thing we need to say is that they will never, ever be equal to God. Even if they are opposing gods or false gods, they will never be equal to God. And then others refer to them to, to God as the man upstairs or some similar term. Uh, normally when people do, my first response is, or my first conclusion is, that they obviously don't know God personally. Because God is a person, and He's made Himself known to us. And He is not just a man upstairs or some, some uh, outside force or something like that. He's a, he's a personal God, the creator of the universe, and the one who reached into my life to save me. And then those are those who believe that God is the one who sits up there and just waiting for us to step out of line so He can zap us. Uh, in other words, He's the one with the big stick. But the fact of the matter is that God, although He will and He does judge the world, He is not there sitting and waiting for us to step out of line so that He can judge or punish us. In fact, He reaches out to us, and Jesus is the ultimate proof. The New Testament is the proof that God reaches out. The whole of the Old Testament is full of God reaching into the world to save the world, to offer His salvation. And so... When people don't listen to God and they reject God, yes, ultimately God will punish them. Uh, but He is not there primarily to punish people. In fact, He's there to love them. When we talk about God, and there's a lot more that we can say about God, as I said, in terms of the limitation of time, there's a certain selection of, of truths that I have uh, added to this lecture so that we can have a, a, a relatively comprehensive understanding of God and who God is. One of the ways we can look at God is by looking at some of His, we call it attributes, characteristics may be another term for that. And then some people prefer the word perfections. Because God, uh, when I say to you, I'm a loving person, for example, I, I, maybe I am, maybe I'm not, uh, and that's part of the problem. I'm not constantly loving. I have been unloving many times in my life before. Uh, or if you say uh, to me, I, I'm a happy person, or I say to you, I'm a happy person, then there have been many times in my life when I have been unhappy. In other words, it's not a constant uh, characteristic of my life. Whereas when we talk about characteristics of God, we talk about constant characteristics, which is why some scholars uh, prefer to use the word perfections of God. God is perfect in every single one of these attributes that we'll be looking at. We know about these attributes of God because He revealed Himself to us. And there is much about God that we do not know. Um, we are limited in our understanding. There are issues or facts about God that will forever remain in this world, will remain shrouded in mystery uh, for us. However, based on God's self-revelation, and primarily based on the Bible, uh, where God makes Himself known to us, there is a lot that we do know, and uh, we're going to look at some of, of those perfections. God is perfect in power. Uh, we've already looked at Psalm 139, but God is the Almighty God, 
and He can do anything He pleases. There is there's no restriction on God whatsoever. God can do anything and everything as much as He pleases. Uh, of course, immediately, if you are a theorist or someone who likes uh, to philosophize over certain things or uh, theologize, then one of the questions is, uh, if God can do anything, can God sin? And the answer is no, because one of the other perfections of God, which we will look at at the moment, is God is perfectly holy, and therefore God cannot sin, and He will not sin. Um, and we'll talk about Jesus when He was a human being here on earth uh, some weeks from now. But God made all things by His mighty power, and He upholds, He sustains everything. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 talks about Jesus as the creator and also the one who sustains everything by, the, by his powerful word or the word of his power. Uh, so he sustains this whole universe. That's why the universe hasn't blown up. How come the sun remains where it is and doesn't come any closer or any further? Uh, scientists tell us if that happens, we're, we're in trouble. Either we will burn up or we'll freeze to death. Um, and, and so how does it all stay in place? Well, because God holds it in place. He's put the laws of signs in place to keep it there, and He sustains the universe in the way that He is. Nothing is too hard for God, Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, and nothing is impossible for God, Luke chapter 1, which is why He could bring Jesus into this world without using a, 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 a man uh, to make a baby with Mary. He could have Jesus born of a virgin, something that many people doubt today and even object to. How is it possible that a virgin can have a baby? Well, if it is God, then nothing is impossible for God. Uh, it can rain for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus can die and be raised on the third day. Uh, the, uh, he can calm a storm. He can multiply bread. Uh, he, God can do anything. And so we shouldn't be surprised if, if people in our scientifically minded world uh, are asking questions about whether this is actually possible. Well, if we believe that nothing is impossible for God, then there is literally nothing impossible for God. His dominion extends over every area of life. Uh, in our natural world, God controls the natural world. God controls the spiritual world, world for sure. It's a world that we cannot see out there, but we are aware of the spiritual world around us. We'll talk a little bit about demons and angels sometime later on. But God also controls the political world. And um, when we looked at the way God prepared the, the way for the Messiah, for Jesus to come into this world, uh, God controlled um, the political world. When the Jews went into Babylonian exile, when uh, the Assyrian uh, or the Babylonian Empire was overthrown by the Persians, when Alexander the Greek came onto the scene, uh, and spread the Greek culture and language around the world. When the Jews went into dispersion, um, all of those things were controlled by God. I'm busy reading Isaiah at the moment, and, and you see God making pronouncements of judgment on Babylon, on Assyria, on the Philistines. And so the nations are under God's control. Although God had called the nation of Israel to be His own in the Old Testament, He controlled all the other nations around anyway. So the political world is not beyond God. God is a God of miracles. He thinks utterly impossible for us uh, or in and of themselves are the works of God. In short, God is infinite in power. Um, if you start thinking about the, the biggest possible thing you can think of and God is bigger than that. Think about the most impossible thing that can happen and God can do it because there's nothing that God cannot do. God is absolute perfect in power. But God is also the sovereign ruler of the universe. We've already alluded to that. But He is the King of all the earth. Psalm 47 verse 7. He reigns forever. Daniel 4 verses 34 and 35 um, say that his dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. I am limited. I can only live 70, 80, 100 years if I'm, I'm very old and strong. But God outlives every generation. God is before time and he will be forever. Uh, another concept that is beyond my human brain. My brain wants to explode when I start thinking about where did eternity start. It didn't start actually because it is forever. When will it end? Well, there is no end because it will be forever and God has been and will be 
forever and ever. So it's a, it's a concept that is beyond our understanding. God is sovereignly in control of every aspect of life. And I've talked about this already, the political world, Isaiah 40, and many other places. The natural world where God controls everything around us and can do miracles. The spiritual world, the very fact that in Job chapter 1 we read how um, even the devil was among the sons of God and appeared before God's throne means that the whole of the spiritual world uh, report to God. They, they subject to God, and God controls everything in the spiritual world as well. He sends forth His Word and His Spirit to redeem, to save and renew those whom He has chosen, Romans chapter 9. And by His almighty divine power, God gives eternal life to His people, John chapter 3, verse 16, a verse we know very well. God so loved the world. It's God who reaches out because He's a sovereign ruler uh, of the universe. But then God is also perfect in wisdom and knowledge. Uh, there is nothing that God does not know. As Paul reflected in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, and we've looked at this briefly uh, when we studied the book of, of Romans, where he thinks about Israel and the Jews and their place in God's plan of salvation. Uh, he ultimately comes to the conclusion uh, that God is way beyond our thinking. Uh, we, may, we are limited in our understanding of how the world works and how God's salvation operates, but God is unlimited, and, and we will never be able to penetrate His mind to be able to understand it all. And so, Paul ultimately, in Romans chapter 11, comes to this conclusion as he thinks about uh, everything around Israel and the Gentiles and so on, and he says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay Him? For from Him, through Him, and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever and ever. That's just Paul coming to that conclusion as he thinks about God. And it's almost like his mind wants to explode when he thinks about it. And he's saying... Uh, and, and Paul had a, had a huge understanding. But even Paul said, when it comes to the wisdom and the knowledge of God, I'm limited. I, I cannot penetrate the mind of God to know how He really operates. Therefore, God is infinite in wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And, and this is, again, something that goes beyond my ability as a human to, to comprehend or to work out. God knows everything in the past. That's not too difficult to understand. Uh, God is bigger than a computer, so He can store that information. God knows exactly what is happening right now. Again, that's no, um, a, a no-brainer because it's happening right now. But God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, that is something that is beyond me. Uh, I, I cannot begin to comprehend and understand that a year from now, 10 years from now, 100 years, an eternity from now, that God has been there. Because God is beyond time. He's above time. He's not limited by time. He doesn't think in terms of minutes and, and seconds and days. God is beyond that. He's been there, and therefore He can plan it, and He can, um, if you wish, manipulate what is happening in this world. And I don't understand all of that. But His plans for us are perfect, as incomprehensible as they may be, with our limited understanding. And He orders the details of our lives and His children. Um, another thing that blows my mind is that God simultaneously can listen to your prayers and mine. And right now, uh, I can be standing here uh, and teaching, but around the world, there are other Christians meeting and praying and doing certain things, and God has a view of all of that, uh, because God is not limited in time uh, or space. <clears throat> God is perfect in righteousness. The Apostle John wrote, God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And that is one reason why I said, that God, it's impossible for God to sin. He cannot do wrong because God is ultimately and perfectly righteous. He is perfectly righteous and He's the source of all righteousness. Which is why our salvation is so wonderful. When you begin to understand that God sent Jesus into this world and that Jesus worked out as God's Son, that He worked out our salvation, that God Himself offers salvation, His own righteousness. So it's not me trying to work hard to get to God. It is God reaching down and offering me His perfect righteousness. And that's why we are perfect before God. 
when Jesus comes in, into our lives. It's a wonderful truth. It's, a, it's something that, that other religions don't have. Um, they're frustrated because they want to try and please their God, and, and they can't get to that place. It's always uh, one step below. But God's law, His commands, uh, says Psalm 19, we'll look at that next week, uh, are perfect. His, his law is perfect. He delights in justice and righteousness, uh, and He punishes evil, and He will judge all peoples uh, at the end of this time, and whenever that is going to be at the second coming, uh, and whatever your view is around that. But at some point in time, God is going to judge everybody, and He will do so in perfect justice. Now, as a pastor, one of the, the questions I often have to answer at a funeral, and more specifically when it's the death of a young one, a child or a baby. And that is, uh, where is that person or where is this baby? And, and really at the end of the day, the only answer I have is that God is perfectly just. Perfectly just. And when God makes a decision, His decision is perfectly just. To the point where I won't be able to even argue with God. In fact, I, I, I don't want to argue with God. I will totally accept what God has done. Uh, if, God sends a person alt, uh, if God sends a person to hell, then God does it because He's just. And if God invites a person into heaven and allows a person into heaven, He does it because God is full of grace. Uh, and it's only by God's grace that we can be saved. And, and, and that decision, I know it's a cop-out from a pastor's perspective, but at, at, when I have to answer that question, I say, I'm going to leave that answer to God because I can't tell you, I cannot tell you where your loved one is. If your loved one knew Jesus Christ, then I know that person is with God in heaven. Um, the issue around babies is, is a more complicated one, and we may chat about that at some uh, point in, in the future. But God is perfect in holiness. It's re strongly related to His uh, righteousness. But Revelation chapter 4 quotes Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3 where the angels and those people or uh, creatures around the throne sing holy, holy, holy. Three times holy. Emphasizing the holiness of God. The word holy means to be distinct, to be perfect, to be separate, uh, to be different. And... Uh, God is all of the above. Uh, God is utterly other, different. We, we cannot even begin to understand what God is. My frame of reference is flesh and blood. Uh, I can see purity perhaps as, a, as white or something like that. But, but to try and, and begin to understand what God is and what God looks like in terms of His holiness is very different, difficult for us. In fact, it's impossible for us because God is so different from, from the creation. Uh, he's above creation. God dwells in pure light. And he is light, says John chapter 1, when Jesus comes into the world. In His very nature, God is opposed to all sin and evil, which is why no, no sin or evil can come into God's presence, which is why I cannot rely on my own just uh, uh, righteousness in order to go to God. I need to rely on Jesus. It's Jesus who died. He is light. He is righteous. And He gives me, He offers me the righteousness of God. And it's only because of God, of Jesus, that I can come into the presence of God. Jesus opening the way for me to come into the presence of God. You have no idea how full of respect the Jews are for the temple and the Bible, um, the Torah, anything holy. Um, I've been in Israel and uh, at the Wailing Wall at the moment is the closest that Jews can come to the temple area. They have also dug underneath um, the uh, Western Wall Tunnel, it's called. And at some particular point, they've measured according to all the measurements and workings and out and so on, that they can get the closest to where they believe the, the Holy of Holy, Holies was. And, and at that particular point in time, it's a little um, makeshift synagogue, if you wish, and that's where people gather. Um, but they do, out, they do that out of respect. You don't, even as a foreigner... Uh, as a Gentile, I don't go there without a little yamukha on my head. I've got to cover my head because this is a holy place. Now, just think about that holy place. And, and then as you go on to the Temple Mount, there's a, a big warning sign that says you are now entering an, an, an area that is holy. 
uh, and according to them is you don't know where you're going to trod or, or place your feet. And therefore you've got to be very respectful because you may actually enter the place where the temple was or the exact place where the temple was, um, uh, all the arguments around that. But that's how much respect they have for God. And so uh, they regard God as so holy that they will never, ever, even remotely try to go near the place that they believe to be the Holy of Holies, uh, representing the temple in the Old Testament era. Now just think about that. If that is how they believe how holy God is, we believe that God is holy. Now we can go into the very presence of God, into the very presence of God, because Jesus died for our sins. And we can go into the holy presence of God. Heaven is a holy place. It is the habitation of a holy God. And all of His holy angels are there. They have never sinned, those angels. And His holy people, those who have been saved. Uh, when you go to the book of Revelation, then we are in the presence of God. And in fact, the presence of God will be everywhere uh, in the new heavens and the new earth. And Jesus cleanses us from sin. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, to, to help us enter into the presence of God. And then, God is perfect in glory. The word glory is an interesting one, and, and I think something that we don't always necessarily understand. And here is a quote from uh, the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, ISBE, uh, which is an old, old book, but there's a, more, there's an, uh, a version uh, in, in software that I'm, I'm quoting. Um, the, the word glory is where the ideas of size, rarity, beauty, and adornment are prominent. The emphasis being laid in the first instance on each case upon some external physical characteristic which attracts the attention and makes the object described by the word significant or prominent. Now, if you take that and apply it to God, God is all of that and more, because God is ultimate, uh, utterly holy. God is, is big. God is enormous. Uh, God is uh, sovereign, and, and everything related to God uh, gives us an idea of the glory of God. And so we're not, we're not even able as human beings, especially as sinful human beings, to enter into the glorious presence of God. Only by the blood of Jesus Christ can we enter uh, into His presence. God's glory is related to His majesty. It attracts our worship, First Chronicles chapter 29. And His glory is displayed in creation. Um, everywhere we look, we see the glory of God in creation, which is why nobody has an excuse, because creation even uh, displays the glory of God. Moses requested to see God's glory, and God said to him, you cannot see me, but you can look at my glory from behind, uh, uh, so, sort of seeing God's back if you wish, uh, and that happened in Exodus chapter 33. So even someone so close to God as Moses couldn't, couldn't behold the glory of God. It would consume him completely if he enters into the presence of God's holiness. And then God is perfect in love. In 1 John chapter 4, we read that this is a characteristic of his inherent being. God is love. Not only does God show love, or, or does he love, but God is actually love in his very, in his very being. In love, he created the world. Um, in love, he uh, comes to us to save us. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about his eternal love uh, for us. Uh, and, and that's why He redeems us. God's love is demonstrated in His plan of salvation, John 3.16. And the love of God is the most wonderful love because it's directed to those who were dead in their sins. They don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. Ephesians chapter 4, we were dead in our transgressions, but God, by His love and His mercy and His grace, and love and grace and mercy, all those things tied together, uh, God's love results uh, in our gratitude and our love for Him. God is perfect in His own being. God exists in and of Himself. He has no need for anybody else. God, and we'll look at that in a moment, but God is also existing in a plurality. So God has no need for fellowship with, with other people. He didn't have to create us in order to fulfill Himself. He created us out of His love, out of His mercy. And, and He wants to fellowship with us. That, that's part of this mystery, that God is actually reaching out to creation and although we disappointed God, God still continues to reach out to us. But He has no need of us in order to exist. 
uh, human beings are very different. If we are born as a tiny little baby and left out in the felt somewhere, we will die because we need care. We need something around us. And all of us need some kind of fellowship or communion. Uh, people are just not islands. But God can exist in and of Himself. But God created heaven and earth, including human beings, as an expression of His grace. And He uh, exists as a plurality, as I said before. Three persons uh, referred to as the Trinity. And He therefore has perfect fellowship within the Trinity. Now, having mentioned the Trinity, we need to just talk about that for a little bit. Because this is a doctrine that we really, really need to try and embrace and you will, you will see that I, I avoid the word understand because I cannot fully explain to you how the Trinity works. There are many, many different pictures that people use to try and explain that. But every single illustration falls short. I've heard many illustrations of that. Whether it's uh, water uh, is composed of uh, you know, three or four or whatever, three or two different uh, elements and together they form water. But, but every, every illustration you use will have some kind of a shortfall. Uh, it's very difficult for us to understand that there is one single God, and yet God reveals himself in three different persons. And, and that is very difficult for me to get my mind around. We talk about God as a triune God. Is it just a term that I want to throw out that you need to understand? The Trinity, one God, three persons. How does it work? And on the screen you will see one particular picture. And again, it's a very limited picture. Uh, at the top you will find a picture of God reaching down, a hand reaching down representing the Father. You'll find the cross on the left-hand side. You'll find the dove on the right-hand side representing Jesus, the cross, and the, the dove, the Spirit. But again, you're looking at three circles. And, and there's a lack here of an expression of the oneness of God, the unity of God. And so every little illustration or every picture you will use will have limitations, and we, we struggle to express this. And yet, it is so important for us to understand that this is a critical doctrine for Christians to hold on to. Other terms that we often use for the Trinity include the three-in-one, and you'll find that in hymns sometimes. Um, I've already referred to the triune God. And this particular uh, doctrine that we're talking about is often called the Trinitarian doctrine, or the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, and here is another picture, just trying to capture um, the truth that God is one, but God is also three. Um, and again, it's just a picture um, where people are trying to, uh, to explain that. The term Trinity does not occur in the Bible, so you don't even have to Google it or go on your software, Bible software program, and type it in. It does not occur. You won't find the word three in one, triune, trinity, or any such word in the Bible referring to God. Uh, that, that is very clear. But the Christians in the early days simply accepted that God is, is God, that there is a Father, that there is Jesus the Messiah, and that there is the Holy Spirit. So that was just an assumption initially. But obviously, uh, as time went on, false doctrines uh, sprang up. And it was necessary for the, for the Christian church to come together and to decide almost once for all, if you wish, um, at, at a meeting to say, how do we handle this belief of ours? And so the doctrine of the Trinity was designed by the early church beyond the New Testament canon in order to give expression to this belief that we believe so, so thoroughly, but find so difficult to try and explain. Now, Jews and Muslims will say, you believe in three gods. And Christians say, no, we don't believe in three gods. We are a monotheistic, one God type belief. Jews say, we are monotheistic. In fact, uh, the Jews ha have the Shema Yisrael, where, which is, hear, O Israel. Your God is one. Yahweh, your God, Yahweh is one. And, and, and that they write everywhere, except that they don't write out the word Yahweh. And even, even the word God, they don't write in the, in the actual Hebrew uh, as, as it should, because they, they are too reverent about the name of God to express that. But they accuse us of having or believing in more than one God, and so um, do the Muslims. 
But Christianity is a monotheistic uh, religion. We believe in one God. The three persons of the Trinity are not just three faces of God either. And this is a, a, a way that some people try and explain it. There's one God. Now, one day he will put on one sort of face and then he appears as the Father. He goes back home and he puts on another face and he comes back as Jesus. Now, that is also not right because the three are coexistent. They are three separate persons and yet there is one God. And you can see that I'm even struggling to try and explain that because I can't really explain that. When we look at the Old Testament, we need to understand that uh, the, the Trinity is not a doctrine taught in detail in the Old Testament. Once you accept the doctrine of the Trinity, you can then go back to the Old Testament and now you begin to see some evidence. The evidence is fairly clear when there's ref reference to God and sometimes this God is simply the one single God and sometimes we, as now you read back, you can see this is the Father. And then there is clear reference to the Spirit, the Spirit of God or the Spirit. Jesus is not that clear in the Old Testament, as we will see in a moment. But there are times, and I'll refer to that in a moment, where it seems like the angel appearing to certain people, maybe, and I'm only going to see, may, say maybe, refer to Jesus. But it's certainly true that God and the Spirit of God occur fairly regularly in the Old Testament. When it comes to the New Testament, however, the picture changes dramatically. Because in the New Testament, we have many passages referring to the three in the same breath uh, at the same time. I think most of us are fairly familiar with uh, Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3 and several others as well. And now, at his baptism, and I'm just going to refer to this one uh, in, in terms of Jesus' baptism, Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 16, when Jesus comes out, out of the water, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, in whom, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, in the same context, in the same breath, you're talking about three very different persons operating. Jesus, who is baptized, a voice from heaven, clearly different from Jesus, and a dove, the Spirit, coming upon him, clearly again different from Jesus and different from the voice. And so three of them operating in the same context. When Jesus prays, uh, and we know G Jesus is God, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment, but Jesus has every single characteristic that we have already talked about. Jesus is holy, and Jesus is superior, and Jesus is the creator, and Jesus is everything that God is. In other words, Jesus is God, and yet Jesus, while he was a human being, prays, and he prays to his Father. He addresses his Father, and he talks about the Spirit, whom the Father will give, or he will give later on. So clearly there is reference to the three. The, the list is almost endless when it comes to the New Testament. One other, maybe a couple of others, one, one is in, in Matthew 28, and we know the Great Commission very well. Go and make disciples and baptize them in the name, one name, singular, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus himself stating that there are three persons but one name and one God. I'm going to leave it at that because we can go on and on and on and, and quote many different passages. When it comes to the early church, as I said, they grappled with this issue because initially there was no issue. Uh, they were simply accepting Jesus. They saw Jesus, the disciples. They heard Jesus speaking to his Father. They have evidence of the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus, then also the Holy Spirit coming upon them at the day of Pentecost. So they simply continued to, to talk about that, preach about it. There's the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the Spirit. You need the Spirit and so on. So they simply took it for granted. But then false doctrines started arising. And you had a person, and we've already talked about him, and he was the one who stimulated the New Testament, uh, the early church, in terms of putting the New Testament canon together, because Marcion started teaching, he lived in the second century, and he started teaching that there are two gods. There's a God of the Old Testament, he's the judging God. And there's the God of the New Testament, he's the loving God, that's Jesus. So he started cutting out Old Testament out, cutting out most of Paul, 
and only accepted a few little bits here and there and so on. And of course, the church needed to um, respond to that. They responded in putting the canon together. They responded by talking about these different doctrines. And ultimately, it resulted in um, the Council of Nicaea and several other councils where the early church got together. And they formulated this doctrine where they say, we believe in one God, but He reveals Himself in three separate, distinct persons. And that is where the Apostles' Creed that we looked at right at the beginning comes in. I believe in God the Father. I believe in God the Son, Jesus. I believe in God the Holy Spirit. And so we believe in those three, we believe in one God. And that makes it very difficult to explain. Just in terms of elaborating God the Father in the Old Testament, God is not often referred to as the Father. He is simply referred to as God. There are Father-like things that God does. And there are occasions when God is referred to in terms of the way He operates as a Father, one who cares for His people, and so on. So, as the Israelites expressed their relationship with God, there were occasions when God was described as a Father. But they certainly don't have this concept of the Father as distinct to the coming Messiah and distinct to the Holy Spirit. In the, it's in the New Testament that the Father heart of God, the, the Father concept or characteristic of God comes through very strongly. I've already referred to the fact that Jesus calls Him a Father. He even teaches us to pray, our Father. So the Father aspect or characteristic of God uh, comes out very, very strongly uh, in the New Testament. As Father, He creates as Father, He cares, He shows compassion, He disciplines us as His children, and He guides us as His children as well. So that's what the Father does. Uh, if you want to make that distinction, the Father is the one who, uh, who oversees it all. He is the one who reaches out to us. He is the one who's, who saves us ultimately. But then God the Son, Jesus the second person in the Trinity, uh, references to Christ in the Old Testament are much more indirect, such as, God's Son in Psalm 2 verse 7. And again, we won't know that unless you know the New Testament. The New Testament quotes this verse as a reference to Jesus. So it's only when you know the New Testament, you go back to the Old Testament, that you see God is speaking to His Son. Hebrews chapter 1 talks about God appointing His Son uh, as, as superior to the angels and so on. He's also referred to as a servant of the Lord. And again, the New Testament helps us to interpret Isaiah 53 and, and several chapters around Isaiah, that, that section of Isaiah, to interpret the servant songs as references to Jesus. And otherwise, when you only have the Old Testament, it would be far more difficult to determine that this is really Jesus that uh, is the reference there. And then, as I said before, I'm not going to be too emphatic on this, but some scholars believe that the angel of the Lord and uh, that sometimes the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament may be Jesus himself. The, the fact of the matter is that you have three people coming to Abraham, for example. They look like people. They, they appear, eventually they turn out to be angels. In fact, eventually they turn out to be one of them is God speaking to Abraham, and two of them happen to be angels who go ahead uh, in order to go and destroy Sodom and, and Gomorrah. A bit of a mis mystery type story for us, but the reality is that here they appear to Abraham. One of them turns out to be God. Now, the question that we can ask, legitimate question is, is that Jesus? Is that the Father? Is that the Spirit? Well, we actually don't know. We are not told. And I think we would be uh, doing ourselves a dis disfavor by beginning to speculate too much uh, around that. But the New Testament clearly describes Jesus as God. I have no doubt. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, Jesus has the exact same titles as God. Uh, he is the creator. He is the sustainer of the universe. He is the redeemer. Uh, he is superior to the angels. He is referred to as God, uh, quoting Old Testament verses by saying, God, your God appointed you as the Son of God, and so on. He receives the same worship. People bow down before Jesus. You, you never, a Jew would never ever bow down before another human being. They wouldn't even say that the Caesar is, is, is Lord or is God or anything. Um, but here they come and they bow before Jesus. They give Him the same honor 
and he is exalted as God. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, very, very clearly. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 20 uh, says roughly the same thing, and, and I'm just going to uh, also read that. And I need to just make a very brief reference to the fact that there is a passage in 1 John that has been added later years, uh, which most modern translations take out, and that is the so-called Trinitarian statement, which is not part of the original. We don't need that verse in order to prove the Trinity, uh, but that's just to make it very clear that we, don't, we can't use that verse to try and prove the Trinity. And that occurs in, in uh, 1 John chapter 5, uh, verses 7 and 8. But in verse 20, uh, just listen to the way John puts it. He says, we, also, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Now, you can't have it more clear than that. He, Jesus, is the true God and eternal life. So Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is also God. God, the Holy Spirit, we refer to Him, the third person. He is a personal being, is not a force, is not a wind. Uh, although both the word ruach, we'll look at that later on in the Old Testament, as well as the word for spirit in the New Testament, both can be uh, translated as wind as well. But the Holy Spirit is more than a force. He's not just a force. He's a personal being. He's referred to in the Bible with personal pronouns, with emotions and everything else. And in the Old Testament, he is simply referred to as the Spirit of God or the Spirit. And simply assume that he's there. Now, how the Jews handle that, I don't know. I can't tell you whether they see that as, a, as, a, as part of a God or, s or simply an extension of God. I, I don't know. But they don't see him as a separate being. Whereas Christianity and Christian, uh, the Christian circles, we see the Holy Spirit as a separate being and yet part of God himself. He was active in creation. We see that in Genesis 1. It is the Holy Spirit who enabled people to do God's work. Um, in the New Testament, the Spirit continues to work. There was no question in the minds of the New Testament people about the Spirit. He simply comes to Mary, he speaks to her, and it's by the Spirit of God that you will have uh, a child, and so on. So he simply assumed. And then Jesus talks about the Spirit, and when he's poured out on the day of Pentecost, they saw that as fulfillment of the prophecy. And he is now God with us. He is included in the baptismal formula in Matthew chapter 28, Verse 19. A few more attributes of God. I've already spoken about Psalm 139, so I don't want to uh, go back there, but we use the words, omni the words omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Uh, those words ex express something of what we understand about God. He is everywhere, He knows everything, and He's all-powerful. The word immutable means that God is never changing. He can never, ever change. He doesn't change. Um, now, we have passages in the Bible where God changes His mind. But it's always in response to repentance. And in that sense, God is unchangeable. When, when people repent of their sin, God will always change. But we believe that God is never changing. God is gracious. He extends His grace and His love to us. His love. He is good. He cannot sin or be bad. And God is faithful. He will always do what He promised. A name in the ancient world meant so much more than it actually means for us or even means to us today. A name is an important thing today, but in the old, old ancient world, uh, it, it really represented the person. And so when you talk about the name of God, you're talking about God. You're not talking about anything else. Uh, and so we need to understand it against that background. The word Yahweh. Uh, is one of the names of God. And uh, you have a long quote there from allaboutgod.com. You can read up more, more about that. Just a, a quick little explanation um, about the way the Jews avoid the word Yahweh, which is, I'm using it, but a Jew will never, ever, not even write the, the letters down. Uh, they will avoid that completely. Um, but in, in the Hebrew, um, this is the way you write it, and you write it from left to right, uh, from right to left, rather. 
and, and those are only consonants. And the Jews never, and even till today when you buy a Jewish a newspaper, there are, no con, there are no vowels. They write with consonants only. Uh, there is a vowel system, and the vowel system has been added later on. And it, it's written below and above the line so that you can know more or less how to express the words. Now, this word over here, when the Jews came to this, they didn't read Yahweh, they, or whatever other pronunciation scholars, as you will see from the quote, not all in agreement exactly how to pronounce this word even. But when they came to this word, they replaced the reading with the word Adonai, which means L-O-R-D with small letters. When you look at your translation, your English translation, you will always find Yahweh written in the NIV, for example, with L-O-R-D capital letters. The word Adonai is written with small letters, capital L and then small letters. And when they came to this word, they wrote the words Adonai over here. But then there's a bit of a change in the grammar that takes place to, to fit it onto this word. And what has happened is they have written, that, that's a, an I uh sound, so that is Y, and then it says Ho, Va. But actually it stands for Adonai. And so when uh, Christian scholars in our era started reading this, they thought the pronunciation is Jehovah or Jehovah, which is why we, in many of our songs today, we talk about Jehovah. But it's actually a wrong pronunciation. It is the Hebrew vowels for Adonai. And so most scholars agree that the, most, the, the better pronunciation is something like Yahweh. Uh, but even there, they're not 100% certain because the Jews won't help them. And the Jews stopped pronouncing that in the 2nd century AD. So they, even the Jews don't know how to pronounce that name properly. Uh, but that's, that's where some of the confusion comes in, which is why we, today most people refer to Yahweh or Yahweh, um, whichever pronunciation you prefer, uh, and not to Jehovah or Jehovah as we pronounce it in English. So that gives you the little bit of a background there. There are other Hebrew names for God. The, and, and this word, as you will see from the quote, uh, Jehovah or Ye uh, Yahweh, occurs over all of the Old, Old Testament, everywhere. And you will pick that up in your translation with the L-O-R-D in capital letters. But Elohim is another Hebrew word, which is the common name for God. It's actually a plural name. Um, but it can be used for other gods as well. It's also used for the word gods. The word El is an abbreviated form of Elohim. The word Adonai, I've already explained. El Yon means most high, and the word Shaddai uh, is almighty, or the almighty one. And so oftentimes you'll get combinations of the name of God. So El El Yon means God the most high. El Shaddai means God Almighty or the All-Sufficient God. Yahweh Elohim, Majestic God. Yahweh Yireh, um, and you know the song Jehovah Jireh. Now this is the actual Hebrew for that. It's, Je it's Yahweh Yireh, and it means the Lord will provide or the Lord our provider. Yahweh Rofi means the Lord the healer. And Yahweh Rohi means the Lord is my shepherd. And Elohim Kedushim means the Lord is holy or the holy God. Uh, and so the list goes on in terms of combinations of God. And you'll pick this up in songs uh, very often. In the New Testament, um, the, the New Testament has been written in Greek. The word for God is simply Theos. I think you know that by now. Father, um, often referred to as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord is Kurios in Greek. Uh, and then Most High is another word that we find in Greek in the New Testament as well. Some of the common errors related to our belief in God. The first is just simply denying God, atheism. Atheism says that there is no God, and it means atheos, no God. And, and they um, believe that there is no God, and therefore they have no responsibility or accountability to God. Our response is to point out that creation reveals God to us, and the Word of God tells us very clearly that there is a God, and even our conscience tells us there is a God. Agnosticism is a word that is made up of two, again, the little ah, which is a negative, and gnosis. And gnosis means to know, and therefore agnostics believe you can't know God. They don't deny that there is a God, but you can't know Him. 
Our response is, God has chosen to reveal himself to us, and you can know God. And we believe we know God through Jesus Christ. Polytheism, many. Poly means many, and that's, there are many gods. Um, and that's one of the false beliefs or denying that God. Hindus and pagan religions believe this. Uh, the Bible is clear that there's only one God. Pantheism, the word pan means everything, and that is God is in everything. And therefore, I can worship a tree. I can worship my car. I can worship myself, essentially, because God is everything, and God is in everything. And, of course, that is a, a wrong belief. And then there is monism. And monism, mono meaning one, and that is that God is in everything. God is one. Uh, God is all. I'm God. Uh, many New Age people believe this kind of thing. It's a very popular New Age thinking. The Bible teaches that God is different. He's separate. He's distinct from us. He's not me. I'm not God. And uh, He is distinct from me. And then people deny the Trinity. Unitarianism. Uh, this the denial that the Trinity, uh, and it's held by mostly liber liberal theologians, uh, those who may call them Christian, themselves Christians, but liberal. Uh, Muslims obviously fall into this category. There is also the so-called Jesus-only movement. And this is, there's only one God, and uh, God has revealed himself as a father in the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament, he, it's the same God, but he's Jesus. And so they, they deny that there's a Holy Spirit and a Father, and it's only Jesus. He's only one God. And there are some extreme Pentecostals who hold to this kind of uh, belief today. Some of the application that I want to challenge you with is, uh, do you believe in God, the only true living God of the Bible? Do you know God personally and intimately? Does your life reflect your belief in God? Uh, it's one thing to say, I believe in God. We, we sometimes talk about practical atheism. I say I believe in God, but I practice a life that, that denies God. And uh, there's a real danger for us as Christians to fall into this category, where we practice atheism, but we say we believe in God. But do you base your beliefs in, uh, in God on the real revelation of God in the Word? And are you able to withstand the many attacks uh, that come our way? Every week, and I'm not going to read or sing it, but I will add a hymn or a song uh, such as we know it very well, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty is a hymn, a more contemporary song. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. I want to challenge you as we go through this module to actually sit up and take note of the songs we sing in church, in your church, in our churches. Uh, be aware of the songs and look at the wording. It will confirm and affirm you in your faith, uh, the things that we believe. Now, I'm going to challenge you to read Psalm 139. Uh, the pages in Mill and Grudem I will always refer to as well. And there's a section, uh, in fact, it will follow exactly the eight lectures uh, in Kevin, Kevin Roy's little booklet that you can get from Sandy. And uh, reflect on your understanding of God during this week. And next time, we'll take a look at creation and revelation. And I'll see you next time as we uh, talk about creation and revelation. God bless you.